Hey there, my name is Steve Coffrin. I'm the founder of Boosting Your Financial IQ. And today I wanna to talk about how I became a CFO. This is my story, so this may not be your path. My path, in fact, is actually very non-conventional, non-traditional. You may be watching this video thinking, okay, in order to become a CFO, you need to work in public accounting, and then you need to go into the private world and work your way up from accounting staff to accounting manager to a controller. You may need FP&A experience, and then one day you become the CFO. Well, I'm gonna to talk to you about how I fast-tracked my way to CFO and how you could do the same thing too if you are aspiring to be a chief financial officer in a company one day. Now, my path, like I said, is very non-traditional and that's the good news because it doesn't matter where you are in life. It doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter how young you are, you too can take a path in order to get to the CFO if that's what you aspire to. But here's the thing. I wasn't just looking to become a CFO, a traditional CFO with this green shade on who was like so into like debits and credits and like balancing the general ledger and creating financial reports and being this nerd. Instead, I wanted to be a strategic CFO who really understood the mechanics of the business, the economics of a company, the operating model of how a business truly makes money in order to drive greater value, not just for the company, but for the employees and for the customers. So the path of becoming a strategic CFO is what I'm gonna explain. But in order to do that, I'm gonna start from the very beginning because it's very interesting and a lot of people ask me what my story is, so here you go. When I was 15 years old, I worked at Dairy Queen. I made $4.25 an hour, no joke, $4.25 an hour. That wasn't illegal, that was the minimum wage, okay, but that's what it was at the time. I rode my bike several miles to Dairy Queen. So I'd ride my bike there, I'd work, you know, work the shift, and then I would ride my bike home in the dark. And I did this for over a year. And during that time, I learned how to interact with customers. I was also involved with the closing process, counting the money, you know, tracking inventory and doing management tasks at such an early age. And it was like incredible. I loved working with people, learning people's styles. I learned what to do, what not to do. And it was just, it was a great experience. But it's crazy, 425 an hour, even when you're working 40 hours a week, it's like 160 bucks. And then you pay taxes and you walk away with barely over 100 bucks. So that wasn't really matching my long-term aspirations. So I had to find something different. And one day one of my friends came to me and said, hey look, I'm working for a sprinkler company. And I was like, what the heck is a sprinkler company? I didn't even know what it was. I grew up in California and we were so poor that we didn't even have an underground sprinkler system to water our grass, we'd use the hose. So I was like, okay, well, sounds interesting. He's like, yeah, you can make 10 bucks an hour. You get to work outside and you get to take off your shirt and get a tan. And I was like, wow, that sounds great, sign me up. So I went and worked for this landscape company installing sprinkler systems. I grew very quickly. I had this boss, his name was Skip. He was amazing. He was this ex-Marine and he was hardcore. And he'd always go, hoorah! And get us all pumped up and motivated. And I remember one time I was on the ground, I had this little shovel, like the little garden shovel. And I was digging underneath this fence to try to create a path for the pipe to go. And I was on my knees and I was working the dirt and I was down there for a while. I was tired, I was, it was hot that day and I was just out of energy. And I remember Skip came by and he said, Steve, you know, get out of the way. And he pushed me out of the way. He grabbed this spade shovel, a big long shovel. He used all the force in his arms. He dug out the dirt and then he cleared the path and he goes, that's how it's done. And I was like, you punk, nobody talks to me that way. I was like so offended, so hurt. But instead of quitting or telling him how I really felt about him, I said, you know what? No one's gonna talk to me. No one's ever gonna put me in that spot again. I'm gonna work 10 times as hard and show this guy I'm no sucker. And that's what I did. I like doubled down. That's the day my life changed at that company. And I worked so hard and then he noticed that and then I became like his favorite employee. And he showed me all the technical parts of installing sprinkler systems. How to plumb, how to use a torch, how to solder, how to install the clock, how to install the timer, how to talk with customers, how to collect money, how to do bids, all these things he taught me because you know, I worked so hard and he wanted to invest in me. So that was so critical. Okay, now fast forward, I'm a junior in high school. I go back to work for this company. This is my summer job and they're out of business. 
And I'm like, what the heck? They're just gone. The whole company's gone, the building's vacant. So I'm like, what am I gonna do? Now my sister at the time, she worked at the tanning salon, and she said, why don't you just bring in cards, business cards, you could put them on the desk, and when people are leaving, they can grab a card if they want. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. So I printed up some business cards, and I just created a company name, Steve Sprinklers, I know, super creative. And I started receiving phone calls for sprinkler work. It's funny because I gave them my sister's landline. So sometimes my niece, who was, who was young at the time, she would answer and go, hello, hello, what boy doing? <laughs> like talk baby talk. And it was a customer, they're like, uh, who is this? You know, we're trying to set up a sprinkler system. So like, super unprofessional, but that's what I did. I worked out of my sister's house. I started getting calls. I'd go out there and I would do these sprinkler repairs and sprinkler installations. And I was charging 50 bucks an hour, okay, which was five times as much as I was making working for the sprinkler company and 20 times more than Dairy Queen. I was also doubling my parts. So I had to mark up on my parts. So I was making money off the parts too. So my effective hourly rate was 70 to 100 bucks an hour, which was great. So all of a sudden my income increased quite a bit. I started getting more calls. My scope started to expand because I was installing sprinklers and they'd say, well, can you put in this tree and put in rocks and boulders and build a patio? So I started doing more and more, and then I realized really quickly, like, hey, I'm onto something. So I'd hire my friends, they would come out there and help me, and then the business continued to grow and grow. Okay, I went to college. After I graduated from high school, I was still doing this business. And when I got up to college, I thought to myself, maybe I'll just get a job up here. And I remember I worked for this telemarketing company. Okay, I, I made minimum wage. And I remember I worked for like a full week. I hated it, it was so miserable. And then I got my paycheck, and the day I went to go pick up my paycheck is like $80. I got a flat tire on the way of picking up my paycheck, and my tire replacement was $80. So seriously, I like broke even, and I was like so frustrated. And that's when I thought to myself, hey look, I already have a good foundation with doing sprinklers and landscaping, why don't I double down? So I did that, and I started marketing my business more, and I do more and more work, and then by my junior year of college, my business was taking off and I walked out of college. Two weeks left of school, I walked, I left class. I, I packed up my truck, I, I headed home, and I pursued my business. If you're listening to this, okay, here's the disclaimer. Don't just walk out of class. I regret that. I should have finished school at that time. So don't just drop out of school because Steve said he did it and it worked out for him. But my point is, is that I just followed my, my ambition, I followed my passion and I went and I built a landscape company over 13 years and I started doing these high-end projects. So by the time I was done, you know, we were doing jobs that were over 300, 400, $500,000 for private residences. And we're building hot tubs and fire pits and outdoor kitchens and putting greens and these cool patios. We're building these gathering places for families. I was able to use my design skills, my design thinking to create these amazing outdoor spaces. I enhanced my Spanish skills. I took Spanish in, in school, but I learned Spanish by working with my team. I learned leadership skills. I made a ton of mistakes. And here's the thing. During that time, when I was running my business, I didn't even know how to read an income statement or a balance sheet or a statement of cash flows. I had an accountant, but I had no clue how to read financials. And guess what? Because I was financial illiterate, because I didn't have a really good strategy, because I had limiting thinking, my mindset was off, I failed. And I failed in a major way. And you know, looking back on it, it's like, oh my gosh, like how much better off would I be if I learned how to speak the language money? And if I learn the core tenets of strategy? And that's when I realized that bad strategy and financial illiteracy ruins lives. And I thought to myself, I'm never gonna do that again. So after that experience, I went back to school. I finished my undergraduate in accounting and finance. I got my master's degree in accounting. And then I went into public accounting. And before I went into public accounting, I should back up. When I graduated with my undergraduate degree, applied to all the big four accounting firms and even local firms, and guess what? Zero offers. The economy was terrible, no offers. They weren't really hiring that many people and I was so depressed. I was like so down, so discouraged. Another failure in my life. But I kept working hard, I kept pushing forward. I went and got my master's degree. And during that time, people saw what I did in the landscape business and what I did with my company and they said, hey, come consult us, come teach us how you grew your business so quickly and how you were successful. So I started consulting companies 
kind of by accident. And this definitely wasn't the path I was going to take. I was dead set on going into public accounting, but I did consulting on the side. But then after I graduated with my master's, I got offers from all the big four companies, also from local firms. I decided to go to work for Ernst & Young. And that was an amazing experience working for a global firm. I learned so much. But the key thing was is that I wasn't just into the audit and consulting side of the practice. I was also trying to learn how businesses worked. And during that time, I learned the language of money. I became financially fluent, not just by reading the line items of these financial statements, but understanding the story. So for example, I would look at an income statement and I would ask questions. How do they generate revenue? Who are their customers? What are their competitive advantages? How do they, how do they improve their margin year over year? How do they reduce their overhead costs while growing at the same time? I'd ask all these questions. I'd learn about the products. I'd do site visits. And during that time, my growth just like exploded in the world of business. I left Ernst & Young after that and I started my consulting firm full time. So before I was just doing it on the side. Now I launched it full time. The company is called Cultivar. And then I spent over a decade in that business advising companies, turning companies around. That was really my strength, going into companies and fixing failing businesses and helping to drive firm value. My whole path was doing consulting. But I realized that in order to go to the next level, I needed to upskill. And that's when I applied to an MBA program with an international focus because I wanted international exposure. I wanted to learn strategy on a global scale. So I got into the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University, which was an amazing program, super rigorous. And I met such an amazing network of peers. I mean, these peers are, are great. I still stay in touch with many of them to this day. And I worked my butt off. Now, when it comes to education or anything you're pursuing, it's always hard. It's always hard. But that's the great thing, because when you do hard things, you build confidence and you build this foundation which you could leverage into the future. So I remember having the thought, like, I need to go back to school and get my education. I was like, it's crazy. Like, I have a kid. Like, I'm training for a marathon. I'm running this consulting firm. And by the time I graduated, I had a second kid. You know, I wrote a book. I did all these things. But it's like, I could have come up with so many reasons why I couldn't go and get my MBA. And I would have confirmed that thinking. And guess what? I wouldn't have got my MBA. But instead, I doubled down and I just committed and I just stepped into the dark. And a lot of times in life, that's what I've done is I don't know exactly how everything's going to work out. I don't know how I'm going to find the capacity, the money, the bandwidth, the energy, whatever it is. But I just take a step into the dark. And by taking a step into the dark, I was able to get into this program and I worked really hard. I was so sleep deprived. I thought I was sleep deprived during my master's program. I was like sleeping four, five, six hours. My whole focus was work in school, in home life, and church, and I was trying to manage all these responsibilities. I probably didn't do a great job at balancing everything, but I did it, and I got through the program, and that was a huge lift for me. The next thing I did is I started speaking all around the country, and I started speaking on this concept of strategy and finance and strategic financial leadership. While I did that, I was talking about my book. I wrote two books during that time. I was sharing my book with the people. I was advising companies. And then I met some executives of this company who needed help with their business. So I started advising this company. It's a 50 year old company. They're into construction and renewable energy. And I was helping to turn around the business. And I was so embedded in the company. I was working so closely with the leadership team. And after a period of time, I was helping them to source a new CFO because they had to make a change there. And he said, Steve, why don't you just become our CFO? And I was like, that's crazy. Like I have a consulting firm. My whole family's in Colorado. Like, I mean, I'm not looking to take on a CFO role. The more we talked, the more excited I got. And that's when I became a CFO of a billion dollar company in my 30s. So that was the path that I took to become CFO. I've been a CFO of multiple other companies, including a technology company. And you know, all these opportunities have come because of that journey. So you can become a CFO too, or whatever position you're aspiring to. Maybe you don't want to be a CFO. Maybe you want to be a CEO. Maybe you want to be an entrepreneur, whatever it may be. You can become whatever you want to become if you will work hard enough for it. Also, remember this. 
if you don't ever get there, let's just say you have a goal to become CEO and it's been 10 years and you haven't got there, it's 20 years, 30 years, whatever it is, trust me, your life is gonna be blessed with something even better than what you're asking for and maybe that's why you're not getting it. So that was my path to CFO. I worked really hard, I acquired the skills, I learned how to build financial models and all those experiences leading up to it, you know, doing mergers and acquisitions, advising companies, turning around companies, getting into these businesses and learning all the mechanics of these companies prepared me to be a CFO in the education and everything else. So I didn't go the traditional path, but that's my story. You may have a different story and I'm sure you have a different story. It's not if you do, you have a different story. But whatever your story is, that's your unique path. But I wanted to share mine with you. This is who I am. I love business. I love strategy and finance. That's why I built this whole platform, Booster and Financial IQ. But I also, I love my family. I'm a man of faith and I believe I have so much more work to do on myself to become who I'm supposed to become, but also to have a bigger influence in the lives of others. So I'm glad that you tuned in, that you listened to this episode. It would mean the world to me if you got value out of it, that you hit that like button, leave your comments below. I love comments from the audience. It helps me to learn, to grow, and to constantly improve the things that I'm talking about. And also, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that. Subscribe to the channel now so you get updated every time I drop a new video just like this. If you're not a member of the Boosting Your Financial IQ community, you could go to BYFIQ today to join for free. Join the community, you'll get the support, tools, videos, access to our Q&A forum, you'll get growth challenges, and you'll get everything you need in order to strengthen you along your path to living a better, more abundant financial life. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and get out there and work hard to accomplish what you deserve.